right, thank you. It is, it is an honor to be back. And um, unfortunately, Dr. Wyman had to take off on me. Kathy had to take off on me, but wow. So you guys razz them about that. It was very rude of them. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some of my research that I've done. And I've been working with some fungal pathogens on um, sugar beets. And I'm in the plant pathology department or the plant soil microbial science department when the plant pathology discipline, as we have to say it. So I'm gonna, I, I figured most of you don't really know what plant pathology is. Like most people I say, I'm um, working in plant pathology and they're like, well, I don't know what that is. Well, it's pretty easy, plant pathology. Um, but I'm gonna give you a kind of an introduction to what plant pathology is. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the research for my uh, current projects. I'm not going to talk too much about it because, quite honestly, it's not all that interesting. It's kind of just some preliminary stuff. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about my PhD project. So right now I'm trying to finish up my master's degree and I'm con concurrently working on my PhD. So uh, this is some of the work that's going to be, I'm going to um, springboard off of my master's work onto my PhD and build on that. And then I have a little bit of um, some advice, some lessons that I've learned um, starting in graduate school. So I want to start with this quote by um, one of my favorite professors here at Spring Arbor, present party excluded from the, the um, Joel Jaworski. He was the biology professor here for a lot a lot of years but he says biology is the study of plants and their parasites and if you think about that it's really it really is true plants are kind of the, the base of food um, the base of the food chain all the energy is brought in by plants and then everything that exists everything that lives feeds on plants in one way or another so um, I'm kind of at the um, the, the cusp of this, because uh, I'm working on plants and their parasites directly. So you might be surprised to know that plants also get sick. Um, so one of the things you probably don't notice this very much, but in, in your walking around everyday lives, but um, plant diseases can cause upwards, it's really hard to estimate how much um, problems are worldwide, but upwards over 15% of the economic dollar value losses. And it, as you might expect, it's primarily agricultural. They have, you know, the right conditions for disease epidemics. They're uh, monocultures, you know, large fields of the same crop. So conditions are really good for um, diseases to spread in a agricultural system. And here is a, a field that it's kind of hard to see it on this screen, but so there's a bunch of dead plants here. We've got some green here. This is actually a, a research field where they're testing varieties for resistance to sudden death syndrome, which is a soybean pathogen. And so you can see the difference, like here's some that are really sick. And there's a lot of their healthy. So there's a lot of differences in your varieties on their resistance to particular pathogens. And that's one of the things that we look at, you know, how, how resilient, how resistant are these um, different varieties. Uh, this is turf grass, which is another really big um, economic um, crop, I guess. It's not really a crop, but there's a lot of dollar values in turf grass. And this is a, um, and I can't remember what this is, but it's a, a fungal pathogen that is destroying. Who wants to play on a green that looks like that? So, also you gotta keep in mind, it's not just quantity, but it's also quality. Diseases affect the quality of our crops. So here's uh, two apples. Uh, this is a nice, beautiful apple. That's the kind of apple that you guys wanna eat, right? And here's one that's infected with apple scab. And, Nobody wants to eat that apple scab apple. If you look, they're like, mass-wise, they're pretty much the same, but 
the dollar value that that apple on the right is pretty much worthless um, and by the way if you want apples like this fungicides you, it, there's no way around it there's some resistance to apple scab but there's no way to control it other than fungicides there's also toxins that are produced by pathogens so for the organic chemists in here now hopefully he won't uh, in the question section he won't ask me to identify any functional groups here because <laughs> I flushed all that information <laughs> but this is aflatoxin um, is produced by some aspergillus species and this is vomit toxin and these if these are present yeah, you imagine what it does right and if these are presents in one part per million in, in your grains, um, they can cause sickness in animals and people. So you imagine a whole, um, a whole load of, of wheat being rejected because they, they found a sample that had one part per million of one of these toxins in it. Um, Plants are affected by the same general pathogens that humans are. So, for example, viruses. Just like humans are affected by viruses, plants are too. Uh, certainly different species of virus, if you want to call viruses species. Uh, this is plumpox virus caused by a uh, potivirus. And it creates these little rings around in the leaves. It also deforms the fruit. And again, who would want to eat that nasty looking plum? This is the um, SEM, a potivirus. It's really odd. It's really long, filamental type virus. Very strange. Uh, this is, they have actually developed a resistance to this virus through transgenic plums. It also affects peaches and other stone fruits. There's also bacteria. Um, bacteria are the big players in human disease, right? Um, in plants, it's, it's not such a big player. Probably 20%, 30% of uh, plant diseases are bacterial. But they do cause some serious problems. Like this is fire blight caused by Erwinia amalarava. And it infects the blossoms, kills the branches, uh, aborts the fru fruit. And here's a, a fruit, an uh, immature fruit that's infected. And these little um, ooze droplets are loaded with bacteria. There'd be billions in, of bacteria in that little ooze droplet. And so when rain hits it, it'll splash onto another uh, blossom or, and it's spread that way. Uh, there's really no treatment for this. That's one of the problems in plants is there's really not a lot of registered antibiotics for bacteria. So basically you cut the tree down, burn it, start over. Also, there's some protists that cause disease. Uh, the most um, prominent are the water molds. They're fungi-like um, organisms. And this is late blight caused by Phytophthora infestans. Anybody know what the big significance of that disease is? The Irish potato famine. And so every, patho every pathologist has to learn about this disease in, in introductory plant pathology because this, it was such an important, this is kind of the, the pivotal point in history where we said, we need people to study these diseases because this like almost decimated a population because of this disease. So it causes um, not only vine kill, but necrosis in the potato tubers. Nematodes, little tiny worms. Some of them are microscopic, um, maybe 20 microns long, five microns wide. Then this one here causes a root knot. So here's healthy roots, here's some knotted roots. And it, you know, it stunts the plants. The roots don't act or don't work properly. 
Um, one of the things about parasitic, plant parasitic nematodes is they have this little stylet. And this stylet they use to pierce the tissue, inject cell wall degrading enzymes, extract nutrients. I don't like working with nematodes personally, but. Um, and then there's fungi. Now these fungi are the big players in plant pathology. Probably, I, you know, honestly I'm kind of guessing at this, but more than half of the diseases, probably 60% of the diseases are caused by fungi. And when you think of fungi, you're usually picturing like mushrooms. These are the store mushrooms, agaris. And morels, how many of you like to hunt morels? Um, this is a uh, fly agaric, and this is what we would typically call a toadstool, and they are extremely poisonous. Uh, one, one bite of it would kill most people. Uh, shelf fungi, you see these in the woods all the time. They're really hard. Um, I don't know that they're poisonous, but they're not really edible. They're like eating tree bark. This is uh, called lion's mane, and this is edible. It looks kind of funky, but it is edible. And actually, um, in my biology of fungi class, we were able to culture some of this and take it home and grow it and eat it. And these are really, really, really good. These are really delicious. Um, then there's your typical bread mold. This is probably penicillin or aspergillus. Um, you probably see this a lot in your refrigerator. But the, the thing is that those things that we just looked at are the fruiting bodies. They're not really the, the real body of the fungi. The, the real, the, the fungus is really this mycelium that lives hidden away. You don't really, you don't usually see it. And when it's time to produce spores, it'll do this fruiting body. Other, um, other fungi don't produce those fruiting bodies, they produce spores. So but we'll, go, we'll go through some um, more common diseases. This is one our lab actually works on. It's a cercospora leaf spot on sugar beet caused by cercospora baticula. And it causes these little red, um, well, these little um, spots that have a red halo around them. And eventually it'll cause the leaf to burn down reduce yield of sugar beets. They produce these little um, pseudostromata in the lesion. You have to kind of look at them under a microscope or maybe a hand lens. And those uh, pseudostromata produce these little needle-like spores. Yeah, there, there's the spores right there. They're long and needle-like. Still, you have to look at them under a microscope. So these are, these are the fruiting bodies of this particular fungus. Uh, this is early blight. Um, this is actually, well, caused by Alternaria species. This is Alternata, Alternaria Alternata. And this is actually the first fungus I've ever worked on when I was here. I did a little research project on this, on this fungus. And this was actually the first disease that I ever diagnosed for a friend of mine. She said, here's, my tomatoes have this. And I, oh, that's early blight. So you have to burn all your stuff and bury all your residue and this is uh, powdery mildew on grapes and you can see why it's called powdery mildew it's got all this powdery residue on the, and that's all hyphae or spores covering the surfaces um, it reduces yield makes the grapes uh, unusable it'll eventually it'll eventually take all the liquids and nutrients out of the grapes and so they're use, unusable and this is their fruiting body. It is a chasmothecia. And so all the spores are inside of this, and it's closed like a, like a ball. And it's, a, it's adorned with these little appendages. Um, probably makes it stick to insects, so insects can take this to a different plant. Um, this is uh, wheat rust caused by Puccinia graminis. And this is one of the other diseases that all introductory students have to learn because the life cycle is very complicated 
and some fungi have very complicated life cycles. This is one of the most complicated. So it starts off as a teleospore, and this is overwintering in debris, so, you know, soil debris, and it produces these basidia and basidiospores. These basidiospores go in the air and land on a barberry leaf, and on the barberry leaf, they produce these um, pycnium, and these pycnia produce pycneospores down in this area, and they're ejected from the, the cavity. And it also has these receptive hyphae. So the spores will fly out, land on another, uh, another fruiting body on one of these receptive hyphae, and then it'll grow into it, and it'll produce these spores, ACO spores. These spores hang down from the bottom of the leaf, then the spores fall out, wind catches them, and takes those to the wheat plant. Now these, this is where fungi get weird. They're not diploid. Most of their life they're either haploid or heterokaryons, which we call N plus N, so there's two nuclei in there, but they're from different parents. They don't, they don't fuse until way, way down in here. So most of, most of their life, they're either haploid or heterokaryons. And then they'll infect the wheat, and they produce these uridios. Uri, uh, and these um, recycle the infection during the growing season until we have these red pustules all over your plant. Eventually, they, as the year, the weather changes and becomes fall, they'll turn into teleospores, which are these really thick walled. And in the spring, they'll undergo karyogamy, where they fuse and they become a diploid for a day, maybe, and start to cycle over again. Sometimes it's hard to tell <clears throat> if a disease is a, or if it's a disease or if it's something else. So this definitely looks like a disease <clears throat> to most of us. And what this has, it's um, co-opted the corn kernels and, and made that its fruiting body. So the outside of skin you see here is actually the corn kernel and it's growing inside of the corn kernel and expanding it and eventually that'll be like completely full of spores. But some people can these things, who look kosh, and eat them. So is this a disease or is it a delicacy? I guess it depends on who you are, right? So I'll talk now about my, my organism that I'm working with, Rhizoctonia solani. It's a basidiomycete. And that's related to the other fungi that produce um, the fruiting bodies like we normally would think of with a mushroom. Although this doesn't produce any mushroom. It is ubiquitous. It's all over. You'll find it in any soil you check, just about. Soil-borne, obviously. <coughs> it, it, there are... There are um, particular strains that can affect aerial parts. <clears throat> but for the most part, it's soil borne. It has a very broad host range. <clears throat> As a whole, Rhizoctonia solana as a species infects over 200 economically important plants. So it's huge. Um, and it does not produce any asexual spores and it rarely produces a sexual stage. So this reproduces primarily vegetatively, just growing through the soil, producing storage structures, growing again. It's a heterokaryon, but even more than that, it's multinucleate. And so here is a cell with four nuclei in it. There's another one. <coughs> this will have anywhere between four and 10 nuclei per cell, all haploid nuclei, and how it regulates those, nobody knows. That would be a good project for somebody to figure out. Has this distinctive 90 degree branching, right like this, with this uh, 
constriction at the branch point. It also has what we call a dollapore septa. And you can see it here. Hopefully you can see it. Um, it's, it's pretty unique to this group of fungi. It also lacks clamp connections, which is a characteristic of Bisidiomycetes, that they have clamp connections. But this, this might be one of the only, if, this, might, this is one of the few, if not the only, group that does not have clamp connections in the Bisidiomycete. And here's a clamp connection right here. And what it does is when it's, when it's separating, when it's dividing, it shuttles nuclei into that clamp connection. And then it, it walls them off and it, it puts them into the new cell so that it controls the nuclei that are being put into each cell. So this might be, the lack of clamp connections might be why um, this is, it's multinucleate, it's unregulated, um, uh, unregulated nuclei transfer. Like I said, it produces no asexual spores, but it does produce these manilioid cells, and they look very spore-like, except they don't, they don't pinch off and then and break off. So this is probably um, probably a function that this this group has lost over time, the ability to pinch that uh, pinch that cell off and become a spore. They uh, these uh, manilioid cells form this tight mass called uh, sclerotia-like bodies. Are not true sclerotia. True sclerotia has an outer rind and an inner. Um, what we call medulla, or the, this just has more the medulla part, it doesn't have the outer rind. So the other thing about Rhizoctonia is it's a species complex. So maybe the term you're more familiar with, like in animals, is cryptic species. So these are species that are genetically isolated, but you can't distinguish them morphologically, with an, or without very minute characters that, um, so Rhizoctonia is, is one of these, there's, there's no really good characters, morphological characters that distinguish the species. Um, so what they have done is they divided these up into what we call a nastomosis group. And these are based on the ability of the hyphae to fuse. So here is some micrographs of hyphae fusing. So here's hyphae A. Here's hyphae B. They've grown together and created a link in between them. This is what we call perfect fusion. This would be something that would happen between isolates that are genetically identical or clones of each other. So usually in, in the same isolate this happens. And this is what we call imperfect fusion. And here you see a picture where there's a fusion site here and on either side of it is dead cells. And this would be how isolates would behave if they're in the same anastomosis group, but they're not clones of each other. So if they're in different anastomosis groups, they won't even recognize it. They'll just grow right past each other, like, like they don't even exist. So currently, there's at least 13 anastomosis groups identified. And that kind of depends on how you want to split these up. Different people argue about different things. Um, and further, these subgroups are divided into intraspecific groups. And these would be based on maybe some genetic character or some host range. So this is what kind of got my research started. Originally, originally, um, this group that we call AG22, the anastomosis group 2-2, is divided up into two, three primary subgroups. And we call them AG223B and AG224. And first of all, it's kind of confusing, Roman numerals and letters. And, um, but there were some questions about the reality of that, of those groups. They're based on the ability to grow at 35 degrees. So the 3B isolates can grow at 35 degrees, the 4B, the 4s cannot. And then we have some intermediate ones that don't really fit into either group. So 
there were some questions about how valid those groups were. So we did a multi-gene phylogeny. Actually, my, our collaborator did this. And we found that these interspecific groups, 3B and 4, are not phylogenetically supported. So they're not real groups. You can see like this group here is primarily group fours, but the other two groups, they're just they're kind of just distributed throughout there. So they're not they're not real groups. Instead we find that uh, instead we find that there's three well supported clades here and maybe some other not so supported clades but uh, so this became the kind of the basis for my work is the, the research question is there any biological significance to these genetic groups so is there some host preference or is there some virulence um, is one of the groups more virulent than others? And these kind of these kind of answers to these kind of questions can help us um, with management strategies. So if you have, uh, say, say that we found that the um, group three were weak pathogens, and if you have group three isolates in your field, you might not be as concerned as if you had group one isolates that were highly aggressive. So it can help help you decide make management decisions. So this is a sugar beet field that is heavily infected with Rhizoctonia. And you can see all the, the bare spots and the dead plants. And, and this is a pretty, uh, pretty bad infection. One of the interesting things about the, the root rot disease of Rhizoctonia is that it causes the leaves of sugar beet, they don't just wilt. So typically a wilt, um, the leaves will start to droop and then at night, when there's not so much stress on them, they'll, they'll recover a little bit. And the next day, they'll droop a little bit more until eventually they die. But with, with Rhizoctonia root rot, the leaves turn a little bit yellowish green, and then they just collapse. And they lay, lay flat right on the ground like that. So when you see that in the field, you know that's, that's Rhizoctonia. Um, it doesn't really penetrate very deep into the root. It's pretty shallow. You've got a pretty well-defined margin between necrotic and healthy tissue. But what will happen is the tissue will shrink and crack and it allows it to gain access into uh, deeper into the root. And eventually it will rot the entire root. We, when we harvest our Rhizoctonia nursery, we get um, beets that have been completely rotted. We call them dirt clods. They're just completely dead tissue. So one of the questions I wanted to ask that sugar beets are planted very early in the spring. So the, the idea is to maximize the growing season. The longer the growing season is, the bigger the beets will be at the end of the season. So the idea is you want to get your, your beet seed in the field as early as possible. So as soon as the ground is workable, farmers are planting sugar beets. And there's some extension work that says that there's no risk of Rhizoctonia infection below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 15 degrees Celsius. And we had some suggestion, I guess, that that wasn't really true, that, there, that Rhizoctonia could cause infection at, at temperatures below that. So that was one of the tests I did. And here is some of the representative seedlings from that experiment and here's a healthy a healthy root with no disease this would be scored as zero and it and it goes up to a one two three four and then here's a five that would be dead so this is a zero to five scale and this is a histogram of 35 isolates that i tested at 11 degrees and 43 percent of them had moderate to high virulence at 11 degrees. Fifteen percent of all the plants that I assayed were dead. So clearly it can cause disease even as low as 11 degrees. And I you know, was asked, why didn't you test it lower? Well, that's as low as the growth chamber can go. So, And we wanted to com um, uh, compare these to the phylogenetic groups to see if the, any of the groups had more 
um, aggressiveness at that temperature, and there really isn't. And so we do have some significant, statistically significant differences here, but so this, this is an important point too. That's statistically significant, but is it biologically significant? I would say no. But what is biologically significant is all the groups on average cause more disease than the uninoculated control. So clearly we've got a concern about infection below 15 degrees. Um, I'm going to skip this. I'll come back to that concept here in a minute. Um, also, I wanted to look at this on dry beans because dry beans are commonly grown in rotation with sugar beets. So you get the same kind of thing, patchy, patchy um, bare spots and um, dead plants. A lot of times with beans, they'll just be killed before they even um, emerge from the ground. You get these reddish brown lesions that kind of follow the, the margins of the, of the root, probably where the um, lateral roots are coming through the epidermis. Uh, this is the greenhouse screen that I did. Um, so we have really nice greenhouses at, at MSU. It's, it's really, uh, really helpful to have such big space. Um, this was the one of the growth chambers that I'm, I use to do this. And as you can see, some of the beans haven't even emerged. Some are, some are up and healthy. So we definitely see differences in the groups. And here we have group one is very aggressive in both at seedling and at 14 days. And we know there is um, age-related resistance. So as a plant gets older, it's less susceptible to diseases. Um, so that's why we tested it at both the seedling and the, the adult stage. Um, group two is more aggressive as a seedling, but at 14 days, there's not much difference in them. So we do see some differences in the groups. Um, so when I did a correlation between the virulence when it was inoculated at planting and the virulence when it was inoculated 14 days after planting, there is a significant linear component to that. But if you look at the R square value, it's really low. And you can see, like up here, we get some, you know, some good relationship, but out here it's really scattered. So this, this was like really important to me and, and how I'm going to develop some of my future work. So not only do we have variation among the isolates, so here we have a highly virulent one and a weak one. Also, at, as an adult, there's differences. But So if we use this regression line and we predict what the disease score should be, so if, there, if it was a 3 at planting, the prediction should be it's 1.43 as an adult. And when it's 6, okay? So let's look at this isolate right here. And so we, based on the disease score at planning, we should predict it would be here. Or we should predict it would be here, but in reality it's here. So what we see is a 33% reduction. And if we look at this one, we have kind of the opposite thing. The prediction should be here, and we see this. So this one is more aggressive as a relationship. So that leads me to my hypothesis for uh, my, my PhD work. That I'm, my hypothesis is that differences in sequence and or the expression levels of cell wall degrading enzymes that are produced by the, fungi, the fungus and the combination of those variants are responsible for the majority of this variance we see in virulence. So, I'm still developing this, this project, so um, I'm just going to kind of think out loud for the next couple minutes about the kind of things that I'm expecting to see with this and the, the type of research I think I need to do to, to um, test this hypothesis. 
so I kind of need to go over this quick but so the the fungus releases oh, first of all we tend to think of cell walls as like like cement blocks in a wall that they're they're solid but they're really not they're they're composed of these polymers like this is cellulase or this is cellulose and this is pectin and all these these polymers are tied together and they create the integrity of the cell wall and it, it makes it hard for um, external um, external organisms to get through the cell wall so what the fungus does is it puts in enzymes like a, a polygalacturonase and it comes in and it'll clip those pectinases or clip those pectin chains and it starts to destroy the integrity of the cell wall. And of course the plant responds with its own defenses. So here's some lignin being deposited, some reinforcements of these, these strands here. Um, this, this structure here, extensin, is holding those cellulase strands together. So it's trying to prevent that uh, loss of um, integrity in the cell wall. It also will produce um, inhibitor proteins that might bind up the pectinases and prevent them from doing their, their job. So, so it's really, it's a, it's a dynamic battlefield going on here. So my thought is that the combination of, the combination of the types of cell wall degrading enzymes that are being produced the types of inhibitors that are being produced, the structure that we've got going on in here, the types of, so another thing that can happen is when it's cutting these um, strands apart, it releases these little small fragments and they can be detected by the plant and then that would trigger defense mechanisms. Well, if you, if you cut it up into different size fragments, the plant might not be able to detect them. That it might not match that receptor that's here. So, so these variations in all these enzymes are what is giving the differences in virulence. That's so I plan to do some um, confocal microscopy and the object would be to confirm the localization of these enzymes. So our these inhibitor proteins being localized to the spot of infection. Are these polygalacturonase, that's, polygalacturonase is really the enzyme I'm gonna focus on. Are they, are they really being secreted in, in sufficient amounts at the site of infection? Um, gonna do some cell wall staining. There are certain stains that you can use to um, differentiate cell wall integrity. Those, so cells that are intact will stain different than cell walls that have lost their integrity. Maybe do some GFP, green, green fluorescence protein labeling of some of these different um, compounds to see if um, I can detect them in, under the microscope. The, the problem with this is gonna be, we don't know what genes are actually being expressed. So they, they did a genome of an AG22 isolate and identified over a thousand punitive cell wall degrading enzymes. And so certainly I can't um, look at all thousand, there's like 1200 even. So we're probably gonna do an RNA-seq project. And RNA-seq would be where you, you'd take all the RNA from the interaction site and convert it into DNA, sequence it, cut it up into little fragments, sequence all those little fragments, reassemble it. Actually, I'm gonna, uh, actually I do have a chart there. So, so here's all the RNA sequence reads. They're small, 150 base pairs long. And you assemble these, align them to a genome. And then you can tell um, if there's unique genes in that organism uh, what the transcript levels are like, so you know if, if a particular gene is upregulated or downregulated. The, the problem will be um, 
the, the problem will be that, well, we're probably going to end up having to do a de novo assembly because um, it's going to probably be really difficult to to align, especially since we have plant, we'll have plant and fungal material in the same in the same read. It's probably going to be hard to align it to a genome. So we're probably going to have to do a de novo assembly and then align those assembled transcripts to the proper genome. So like I said, I'm still kind of working that, that whole thing out. And it's really complicated, to tell you the truth. Um, once we have that, know what genes are being expressed, we can do qPCR. And this, this is a method to quantify expression levels. And it's much cheaper than RNA-seq. And I could, I could process a huge number of samples that way. We could test um, different varieties, different isolates, different combinations to, and then we'll probably do some sequencing of target genes to look for um, mutations in that. So um, just to wrap this up, I have a couple um, bits of advice, the lessons I guess I've learned in grad school. And if you're thinking about going to grad school, probably the, the, the big thing is have a very clear idea of your research interests. So you want to address a big, a big picture problem, but you want to be really specific about it. Um, so I think, so when I, when I applied, I was applying for a PhD program and I didn't get any funding. So I was accepted into the department, but I didn't get any funding. And I think this was my big problem. So I was like, yeah, I want to work on plants and pa pathogens. And they want to know some specifics about what you want to work on. Okay, so be, be really specific. Talk about a big problem, but be really specific about it. Um, the other thing is you want to find a PI whose interests align with yours. Or you might need to adjust your interests to kind of fit their goals too. So you see somebody says, I like what this person is doing, but it doesn't quite match what I want to do. So you might want to adjust, um, adjust your goals for each specific PI. And the PI would be principal investigator or the person that would be hiring you. I didn't know what that term meant for a long time. <laughs> the other thing you need to hone your presentation skills. So I was really, I, I walked around the halls a little bit, I see there's posters all over here and that was really exciting. I, because I got there, I was like there for like six months and they're like, we're gonna have, we have this thing, we need to make a poster and a, a poster? <laughs> That's what my daughter did in middle school. I, that was, <laughs> but posters are very important in grad school. You will do a lot of posters. I think I'm at 10 now. And when you have a chance to do classroom presentations or something, do it with enthusiasm. Take it seriously. It was because doing presentations is another really important skill in grad school. And I still feel like I really suck at it. And all I see, like only 10% of you are asleep, so I think I'm doing okay. Um, the other thing is practice your scientific writing. And this is like, writing is the hardest thing in grad school, I, in my opinion. It's the hardest thing to do. And writing well, writing scientifically, it is very, very hard. So one of the things you wanna do is read scientific journals. And I'm not talking about um, popular science. That's not what I'm talking about. Read scientific journals. So um, when, when your professor is talking about a particular subject, you know, maybe he'll give you references, maybe they won't, but if, if you want to know more about this subject, go to the literature and find a scientific journal on that and read it. That's one of the best ways to get used to what scientific writing is like, is reading it. And you, you, in grad school, you're going to read lots of papers. It's very annoying. And if you have the opportunity to participate in a writing project, so I know... Um, I know Dr. Bradovich does a lot of, a lot of writing. Um, I don't, I don't know if, 
I, um, Dr. Councilman puts a lot of um, things in uh, Journal of Chemical Education, is that what it is? And I think uh, Dr. Wyman is doing some, some writing. If you get a chance, participate in a writing. Um, and when you, have to do, when you have to do writing as an assignment for your class, take it really seriously. Because writing is a skill you've got to have for grad school. And, and the sooner you start to get those skills, the better. And so with that, um, do some acknowledgments. Linda Hansen is my PI. She um, actually works for the USDA ARS in East Lansing. Uh, Frank Martin is um, one of our collaborators. He did the, the um, phylogeny, and he's helped me with uh, different aspects of my project. Um, Tom Goodwill is our technician, and our funding is provided by the Beet Sugar Development Foundation and Michigan Sugar. Thank you.